you're about to watch a St. James sermon. Here at St. James, we believe in the faithful teaching of God's Word, the Bible. We believe in the faithful proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe in God's church. God's church expressing itself in the gathered body of believers around God's Word. So if you're watching this and St. James is close by, we want to invite you to come join us and become part of our community here. If however you're watching this from elsewhere, we want to encourage you to go find a local Bible teaching church and become part of that community there. If you're here to just enjoy the sermon, then we encourage you to enjoy it and be edified by God's Word. If ever you're close by, come and join us. But for now, grab your Bibles and let's get stuck in. They prayed for the Bibles for Namibia, and it is, we're delighted to say thank you so much for your great generosity already. Um, we've raised 10,000 Rand for Bibles. So isn't that wonderful? Don't stop. They need more. Um, can I also just mention that next week is going to be communion. Um, we do provide communion for you, but uh, it's always a good thing to be preparing our hearts before we come and take communion. Um, it is a solemn sacrament, and can I encourage you to think about that as we prepare for that next week. Then there's a bit of a notice here from Jenny about our pod club. It takes place on Friday the 12th from 6 to 7.30 in room 5 in the Children's Centre. If you've got anything to do with young children, uh, can I really encourage you to come to this? The topic of the podcast is hope-filled teens, and all you need to do is listen to the podcast in advance, and then on the Friday, join the other parents for a cup of tea or coffee and have a chat about what you've listened to. And then all you, the other thing that you need to do is just let people know that you're coming so that we can have the right amount of refreshments. Um, if you are interested, please do contact Jenny or Leighton at the office because they'd love to have you join them. Simba will be selling his pastries in the DG after the service. Um, and can I just, for those of you who are still wanting to come to the Women's Convention, we'd love to have you. We've still got plenty of space. Bookings close on the 16th, so please do be sure that you uh, book by then. And it's not too late to join a small group if you're not yet in one. Can I please encourage you to think about doing that? We've got midweek uh, daytime studies, Wednesday morning, our seniors meet from 9.30 to 10.30. We've got evening studies, we've got small groups, um, just as a great way to get some more Bible food into us and an opportunity for fellowship. And then finally, um, Grief Share starts on the 3rd of September. If you know anybody who has experienced the great trauma of grief, um, can I encourage you to connect with Michael? He'll be in the foyer afterwards. He can give the information that you need that may be for yourself. Um, it really is a helpful course. Many people have found it something that has just helped them navigate their own grief. Thank you. That's it for the news. Jennifer, oh, Dorothy, thank you for coming to read for us. Oh, collection. Oh, yes. Thank you. For those of you at home, you will be finding the details on your screen. Thank you, Husb. Um, we will be taking collection at the door as you leave the building. Thank you for your giving. Good morning, St. James. My name is Dorothy Machemedze. Um, I'm going to read today's Bible reading from 1 John 2, from verse 15 to 17. I'll start reading. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world and the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world and the world is passing away along with its desires but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Thanks. Um, this is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning everyone. Good to see you. <clears throat> if you have very little people with you who get a little bit wriggly and squiggly, uh, while I'm speaking, it would help us enormously if you could either slip across to first steps or just to the hall behind us, you'll be able to hear and see. I don't often get to tell Alison what to do, so I <laughs> thought I'd just take my chance right there. 
It is a great joy to be with you. Thank you again for your prayers um, for the work in Namibia. What a joy it is. Uh, I saw Kathy bouncing on her seat. Um, that we've been able already to raise in excess of 10,000 rand. What was the target? 15, is that right? Is that what you mentioned, Kathy? No, I think 500 Bibles and 165 So whatever that number is. Well, I think we've got there. So all the more, the merrier, for those who are yet to come. Um, it's a great, really great joy to be back with you in the Bible and thinking together about this important theme that we should have no God, small g, but God, big G. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to look at the Word together. Father, as we turn again to your Word, we do pray now, as has already been prayed, for your Holy Spirit to be at work among us, to help us, to challenge us, Cause us to think like you about these important things. Calm our minds, so many distractions, burdens that we may be carrying. And by your Spirit, will you take this word of yours written so long ago and use it today for us. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Let me begin by asking you to think about the word love. Uh, when I was a lighty and growing up, um, I remember in the newspaper, I think it was, there was this little drawing with the caption, Love Is. Remember those? And then there would be a little drawing, and then there would be something defining or describing love. I remember one which said, Love is never having to say you're sorry, which seems to me to be the biggest load of rubbish under the sun. Because I think love is all about saying sorry most of the time. I speak from experience. Um... <laughs> But what I'd like you to do right now is to just think for yourself about love and how you would define love. If somebody was to say to you, what does it mean to love something, or what would you say? What, would you, what words would you use or choose to describe love? Obviously, there are lots of words that can be used. What word would you pick for love? Love is whatever. Take a moment to think about that. You've got a word in your mind? I looked up the word love earlier this week. Because I'm old, I looked it up in a thesaurus. Most of you young people don't even know what a thesaurus is. You just go straight to Google. But I looked it up in a thesaurus, a book of synonyms. Most of us don't know what synonyms are. Never mind. Is this grammar or church? I'm not sure. I looked up the word love, um, and amongst the many, many, many words defining love, as you can imagine, I found a few that really resonated with me. I discovered that to love something is to be passionate about that thing. To love someone is to adore that person. It's a lovely word that is. To love someone is to cherish that person. Church of England marriage service. Will you cherish them? Honor them? To love someone is to be, or something, is to be devoted. To adore, to be passionate about, to cherish, to be devoted. Just some of the words among the many words that I discovered this past week for love. Now, in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, our text for today, we have, do we not, a clear warning about love. Do you see it there? There's a clear warning in our passage about love. Mind you, it's not a warning against love itself. There could never be a warning against love as love in a book in which we are told that God is love, and that love comes from God, in chapter 4 of 1 John. So John isn't warning us against love itself. But as we look more closely at our text, we notice what? Can you see in verse 15 that John speaks not about one love, but how many? Look again at verse 15. How many loves can you see in verse 15? 
Not one, but two. The love of the world and the love of the Father. That is, God the Father. And so what is the warning in our passage? The warning in our passage is not a warning against love. John doesn't want us to be a-emotional, a-passionate, not adoring, not devoted. It's not a warning against love, but it's a warning against misdirected love. Love shown in the wrong direction. A warning for us not to take, using those words that I found this week, not to take our passion and our adoration and our devotion, at least the passion and adoration and devotion that should be directed to the Father, to God, and to direct it towards the world. In terms of our series... And our definition last week of idolatry as that giving to something else, that which rightly belongs to God, what John is warning us against is making an idol of the world. Do not love the world is really in the letter that says, little children, keep yourself from idols. It really is the warning don't set your devotion, your adoration, your passion toward the world rather than toward God. Don't make an idol of the world. Now the question, of course, then becomes, how does this idolizing of the world happen? How does it take place? at least according to our passage. There are lots of ways in which it happens, but what is it that John tells us about this danger of making an idol of the world? And I think the answer comes for us in two ways. It's really there in verse 16. So I'd like you to have a look again, please, at verse 16. I might remember, I'm not going to put the words up on the screen, because I really would like you to dig into your Bible and look at it for yourself, it's lovely to hold it in your hand, even if it's like this and you're having to do that. Have a look at it and see if you can see what this idolizing, this love of the world looks like. How does John describe it? And to give you an, a clue, it's described in two ways. It's described in general at the beginning and the end of the verse, and then it's described in detail in the middle of verse 16. So he has the task for the moment. As you look at your Bible, as you look at this passage, see if you can see the words that John uses to tell us what idolizing, loving the world looks like in general terms, beginning and end of verse 16, and in more detailed terms. Ready? Go. Have a look at it. Talk to your neighbor. See if you can see it. If I hear you speaking, I know you're engaged. If you're watching from home, you don't get a free pass on this. Please do it at home as well. It's not the time to go and boil the kettle. You got it? I'm sure you have. Two ways in which John shapes our understanding of this love of the world, this misplaced love, this idolizing of the world. In verse 16, right at the beginning and right at the end, there are two little phrases that we should take note of. They really bracket the bit in the middle. In fact, the ESV has very helpfully marked it out for us, in my Bible anyway, because it's given us a little hyphen and a little hyphen at the beginning and end of that middle bit. So the two phrases to notice, first of all, are the phrases, in the world, and the phrase, 
from the world. You see, that puts the brackets around that middle bit. And so in general terms, what we can say is, idolizing the world, loving the world, being governed by the world or ruled by the world in that way, is the problem of being obsessed with what is in the world and what comes from the world. That is to have our focus centered upon what is around us in our world. Now remember how John uses the word world. He uses it in different ways in his letters and in his gospel. The world are human beings whom God loves and for whom he has sent his son. What a great gospel that is. God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's the world as creation which we share the beauty of here in Cape Town and in our great and glorious country and on our continent. How glad we are for God's creation, his world. But the world is also used in John's writings as that which is hostile to God. Remember last week we saw, chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So when John is speaking about the world here and saying, don't love the world, what is he talking about? Or in the world, from the world, he is talking about the fallen world. The world as it presents itself before us and as it seeks to shape us. And so what we learn in general is that our focus should be not, not upon whole, we shouldn't be devoted to that which is in the world and we should not be controlled by that which is from the world. So that already helps us to start thinking about what John means when he's warning us against the love of the world. But of course that is very general, isn't it? Don't be controlled by what's in the world. Don't be shaped by what's from the world. And so in the middle piece, John gives us those three statements that help us understand the problem of idolatry and the problem of this misplaced love. Look at what they are. I think the ESV translates them better than the NIV. Am I right in saying the NIV has the lusts of the flesh? Is that right? The ESV has desires. The problem with the word lusts is that it automatically pushes us down a road in our thinking. When we hear the word lust, especially if we've got teenage boys, we, uh, and men. By the way, I don't see one all-black shirt in this room. Was alle Männer? Ma, kijk da, was jy? Fatswe. And volgende week kom nog a clap. <laughs> Craig Campbell is so ashamed he didn't even come to church today. Actually, no, Craig and his family are away for the weekend. But um, as are many of our folk. Why am I talking about this? I've got absolutely no idea. Back into the middle here. The word the lusts, we think about our teenage boys. We think about men. We think about pornography or whatever, which is a sin, by the way. It's not neutral. What looking at porn is not neutral, because Jesus tells us, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So in this woman's month, let's remember that objectifying women is not a Christian thing to do. And to look at them as objects and not as people is definitely not a Christian way to respond. They are mothers or sisters, remember, or daughters in Christ. How are we to view all other people as fathers, as brothers, as mothers, as sisters in all purity, says Paul to Timothy. But that's not what John is talking about here. The word is actually epithumia. That's, it's the word for desire. So what are the desires of the flesh? Well, flesh here just has to do with our own fallen humanity. And desires mean surprisingly, 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 believe it or not, desires. They're neutral, aren't they, in and of themselves. Desires are not good or bad. The fact that we desire things is not good or bad. So what is the problem here? The problem is when we are ruled by our 
desires. And when what we want as fallen human beings controls us. That's what he's talking about when he speaks about the desires of the flesh. The desires of the eyes are our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions, which are shaped by what we see. Jesus reminds us that our eyes are the window of our soul. Things get let in. Things come in. And we are shaped very often by our experience. For see, eyes just put experience. That's what, this, that's what it stands for. It's our life experience, our experience of life. Using our senses, we're doing in our midweek Bible studies a great deal about Christian experience and our Christian emotions. And very often, our experience in life can influence, does in fact influence dramatically. So when he says the desires of our eyes, he's talking about what we see, our experience. How we see the world through our eyes. Yeah? That's what he's talking about. So how we feel about the world in our hearts. How we perceive the world through our eyes. And the last one, the pride of life, is a very striking phrase. It occurs in one other place. And I'd like you to turn there with me. If you're in your Bible in a book, just go left. Back from 1 John through Peter and you'll get to James. James chapter 4 verse 13 to verse 16. Are you still tracking with us? Yep. Good. It's a problem when you mention rugby then everybody gets distracted or whatever. Football or something. Hey, how about banana banana? Man. There's a thing. Maybe the men can go and take lessons from them. Have you now found James? James chapter 4, verse 13. Come now you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Man, that puts us in our place, doesn't it? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live or do this or that. Now this 16, verse 16 of James 4. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. See that phrase, you boast in your arrogance? That word, that idea is exactly the same word and idea that we have in 1 John. It's self-confidence and self-assuredness. The thing that our kids at school are keep being told that they must have. Yourself. Self-assurance, self-confidence. Now we don't want people's confidence and assurance to be smashed into the ground by abuse or something like that. Of course we don't want that. John's not in favor of that, clearly. God is not in favor of that kind of destructive, break people down stuff. But what John is warning us against is a mindset which is governed by overconfidence and self-centered assurance. How could we summarize these three phrases? The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. I think we could summarize them with the words, I want, I see, I can. Which tells us something about where the real idol is. Yeah? What's the first letter, letter in idolatry? I. We even have a phone named for it. I. 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 That's just my little punt for Android. I, I, I. Actually, it's ironic because my computer died last night. And I'm sure somebody will say to me, yeah, if you had a MacBook, it wouldn't have died. <laughs> See, who's the real idol? What is the real idol? Is it the world with all it has to offer? Well, it's the object. But the idolatry starts with me. I see. I want. I can. The real idol is self. 
Now, we're going to come back to this next week when we look at Acts 17 and what Paul has to say about idolatry, about us making gods in our own image. There's the problem. The world, yes, is under the control of the evil one. Yes, it plays into our self-centeredness. But really, when we read, do not love the world, don't make an idol of the world, what we are hearing in the background is the deep concern about not being self-governed, self-ruled, self-assured. I, 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 idol. We know this is true because the very beginning of the Bible tells us this. Go back to Genesis 3 with me, will you? Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Those of you who have been doing or who did our small group studies um, last term, God's Big Picture, you will remember this, no doubt. Right in the very beginning, in the garden, chapter 3, We're in a garden and there's a snake. Somebody showed me a video today of the biggest cobra I have seen in a very long time. Swimming across the dam in which he and his family were swimming. Which is a bit disconcerting when you're swimming and you just see this guy come. Oh, I don't know what gender it was, but it was, it was big. And eventually the snake catcher came, caught it and put it in a plastic crate. And this snake was, it was creepy. Well, he has a creepy snake. I mean, I grew up with snakes on the farm, and I still don't like them. He has a creepy snake, a crafty snake, a serpent, actually. That ancient serpent who is the devil, Revelation tells us. And what do we find the devil doing? Well, we find the devil speaking. Did God really say? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Can you really trust the Bible? Really? Really? Did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. She got that right. Neither shall you touch it. She added that in. God never said that. This is the problem when we start adding to what God says with our tradition and our own moral culture, is we add to God's word and we end up in the end subtracting from it. Yeah? Whenever we load our stuff on top of what God has said, we always end up subverting God's word. Well, this is what the woman does. The serpent then plays the trump card. Verse 4, if I can talk about cards in church. The serpent said, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now there's the rub. You will be like God. You can be like God. Somebody told me that their son, I was talking to, on the plane actually coming back from Durban this past week, I had another Simeon Trust workshop down there, thank you for praying, it went really, really well. And the woman I was sitting next to on the plane said to me that her son thinks he is God. I mean, he literally thinks he's God, not just like, you know, oh, I'm the boss. No, no, he literally thinks that. So it made me think of Shirley MacLaine, and that didn't end too well for her either. Remember her standing on the beach, I am God, I am God, I am God. It doesn't make you God. But the irony here is, the Satan is offering them, the devil is offering them this, you can be like God. What's the irony? We're going to see this again next week. They are like God. They are the image of God. They are his image bearers. But what he's offering is not to be his image bearer, but to be in his place. To define right and wrong. Does that sound like our world? where we think we know better than God what right and wrong is, how the world works, how gender works, how all these things work, whatever it happens to be, that we get to choose. See, who's in the center now? Me, I. Now, I know there are struggles and challenges in all of these areas, and I'm not wanting to diminish the struggles and the battles and the challenges that people feel with this. But at the end of the day, dear friends, who gets to choose? Who gets to decide? And so we read that the woman looked at the tree, and she saw that the tree was good. 
that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desired <laughs> for making one wise. And so she took its fruit and ate and gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So there he's standing with her with a bag full tanner, actually with a mouthful of fruit, <laughs> instead of saying something. But what I want you to see is that this problem, this problem of being ruled by, I see, I want, I can, is as old as the garden. It is our humanity. It's our fallenness. This is what we have inherited from our first parents, essentially, fundamentally. It's why Calvin said, our hearts are veritable idol factories. What is the alternative to this way of life, being governed by I want, I see, I can? This idolatrous way of living, which puts myself at the center of the world, myself at the center of every conversation, Myself at the center of every institution. Myself even at the center of church. Because it can happen here as easily as out there. Remember, you can take the monk out of the world, but you can't take the world out of the monk. Let's not for one moment think that the minute we walk through these doors, something happens to us. We go through like a self-detector. Or a self-neutralizer. No, no. We bring this junk with us, don't we? That's why this place is for us. Because we are sinners. And that's who church is for. Church is for broken people. Sinners like you and like me who are aware of this fact and who need God's help. So what is the cure? What is the help for this? Well, can I tell you what the help isn't? The help of the idolatry in my life, and it's there... And the help for the idolatry in your life, and it's there, is not for us to tell one another, stop being an idolater. Stop being ruled by I want. Stop being ruled by I see. Stop being ruled by I can. Saying stop doesn't help anybody, does it? It doesn't help anybody. No, no. What we need is not stop, but Start. What we need is not to be told, don't love the world, because what, what are the two loves in our passage? The love of the world and the love of the Father. And this isn't the Father's love for us. This is our love for the Father. And so what John is telling us is that the cure to loving the world is to turn our devotion and our adoration and our passion towards God our Father, because He first loved us. It's what Thomas Chalmers many, many, many moons ago called the expulsive power of the new affection. It's the cure for idolatry. Love for God is the cure for idolatry. And if we find our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our self-centeredness being turned, or our centeredness being turned towards self and the world, then what we need to do is to make sure that it is turned back toward God. This is not rocket science. There's not some magic secret here. Ten steps to beat your idolatry. Twelve steps to sort your love of the world out. Those things are helpful and valuable in terms of nutting this out in practice. But the principle is key. Love God. And that will fix your heart. I mean, in that, I do agree with John Piper. That the desire for God is the biggest and best thing which we in human, as human beings can have. And that is what we were made for. God made us for Himself. And we are designed... Not to ignore the good things of this life. No, but to put them in their place. So that our desire, our passion, our adoration is centered first on God. And then everything else finds its proper place. Isn't that right? I love my wife. I really do. I'm thankful for her. Honestly, without her, I would be a train smash. I'm not just saying that. I really mean that. 
But she can't be God to me. She can't stand in the place of God for me, nor I for her. Nor can your kids be in the place of God for you, or you for them. Our devotion, our adoration must be directed towards Him. And what does this love of the Father look like in practice? Well, it's the very opposite of the love of the world. If the love of the world is being ruled by, I want, I see, I can, then the love of the Father is to be ruled by what? Go back to the garden. What were the options? What are the options? You either rule by, I see, I want, I take, I eat, or you are ruled by, God has said. It's very simple. In James 4, what is the cure for that boastful arrogance? The boastful arrogance in James 4 is not cured by saying, I won't go there, I won't do trade, I won't do anything, I'll just sit at home in my little box and do nothing. No, the cure in James 4 for boastful arrogance is to say, not I will, I will, I will, but if the Lord wills. The cure for being ruled by the desires of my eyes is not to say, I'm not going to look at anything and I'm not going to ever desire. No, it's to say, Lord, if you will, you can. It's to ask God and to say, your will be done. Godliness with contentment is great gain. To be contented in the Lord and who He is and what He has given us. And when we find ourselves struggling with who we are and where we are and our circumstances, it's not to say, I am going to show the world that I'm better than this and I'm going to show them that they should reward me. No, it's to go on our knees before our Father in whose image we are made and say, Lord, please help me to be content and help me to trust you. And then to pray about whatever it is you need changed or want or whatever. And say, Lord, if you are willing... Can I say to you, if you are willing, is not the prayer of unbelief, dear friends. That is Jesus' prayer. And he is the model believer. So the cure for idolatry and the love of the world is the love of the Father. So how do we get this fixed if we are broken, as we all are, in this matter? Back to 1 John. Still tracking? Good. Good. Back to 1 John, as we end. If you look at those verses of ours, the verses that we've just looked at in their context, the verses that come just before them from verse 12 to verse 14 give us great help in dealing with this problem of our idolatrous hearts. If you look again, and perhaps you can do that this afternoon at verses 12 to 14, you'll see that you've got three things repeated. There are little children, there are fathers, and there are young men. And then we go back to the little children at the end of verse 13, the fathers and the young men in verse 14. That's everybody. Little children, fathers, young men, this is his way of incorporating everybody. Now, in verse 14, the beginning, sorry, at the end, I beg your pardon, of verse 13, he says, I write this to you children because you know the Father. Do you see that? Look at the beginning of verse 12. I write this to you little children because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. So, how do you get to know the Father? Little children, little children, know the Father, sins forgiven. How do you get to know the Father? By having your sins forgiven for His name's sake. It's as simple as that. The way you get to know God is by going to His Son and having your sins forgiven by Him. Are you struggling with I? <laughs> Not with me, with you. <laughs> I. Are you struggling with the problem of I in your life? Are you struggling with idolatry? Are you finding yourself being increasingly drawn away to be ruled by the love of the world? The place to start is to go back to the foot of the cross and to say, Lord... Please, will you forgive these sins? 
How do you overcome the evil one? How do you overcome the world? Look at verse 14. It's just what I've been saying. Who is it who overcomes the world? Verse 14. Overcomes the evil one? Those who have the word of God abiding in them. And this is the glory of the gospel, dear friends. When you go to Jesus and have your sins forgiven, as he will most assuredly do if you go to him, Jesus has said, if you come to me, I will never turn you away. It matters not how bad you are. It really doesn't matter a hoot how big your sins are, whatever they are. You can go to Jesus with them. And what you will find is that he will not only forgive you, but he will place his word in your heart by his Holy Spirit so that you can find new power for living this new life. It's that simple. Let me end with these words, a question. Why does this matter, do you think? Why is this important? Why have I been standing up here for the last 40 minutes, actually much longer than I normally preach? Why have I been standing up here and talking to you, I hope passionately, about this? Have a look again at verse 17 of our text. What's at stake? What is at stake here? Can you see it? What's at stake here is eternity. Because the one who does the will of God, the one who loves the Father, whose sins are forgiven, and who seeks to live in obedience to the Father who has forgiven them, that one abides forever. But the world is passing away. And dear friend, it will draw down into its destruction all who cling to it in devotion. It will pull down into destruction every person who clings to it. Pray with me. Father, as we think of these things, somber things, we pray for your help. Help us, Lord, not to love the world or the things of this world, but may the love of the Father grow in us. Thank you, Lord, that you first loved us and that you gave your Son for us. Help us to cling to you, Lord, and so in the end, avoid hell and enter into life. For your name's sake. Amen.